Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Indie Investor Pod. It is Brian and Randy um, on here today for you. And uh, we wanted to do this episode really just the two of us because we had the um, basically the privilege of talking to a group of international investors um, last week. And they just had, they sent us over a list of questions before we were on their, their meeting. Um, the meeting lasted, I think it was like close to an hour and a half or so. Um, just going over some questions, talking about Indianapolis, investing here. And really, we just came out of that. And I was like, well, we have a list of questions. Like, we should probably do a podcast on this. Um, just to help inform people of, of the better stuff. And uh, just really what the conversation really leaned towards was buying from wholesalers. So what do some international investors have to pay attention of? Things like that when they're buying from a wholesaler. Obviously, it's not just international investors. It's out-of-state investors. It's even local investors. So some of these things... Um, that we'll discuss can be, you know, it's for basically anybody that's investing in Indianapolis in general and stuff. So, um, Randy, before we get into this, do you have any, uh, like just, uh, maybe just, uh, something that you took away from that meeting, that presentation that we kind of did for them and answering their questions and stuff? Yeah, I think when, after, when we went through those list of questions with them, I kind of realized like, Hey, like this, some of this stuff is pretty basic knowledge to us. And, yeah. um, it's kind of just like, yeah, it's just, this is kind of how it is. But other people that are kind of getting into investing, um, like you said, either out of the state or out of the country, aren't aware of a lot of this stuff. They're not sure how the process is supposed to work and, you know, what forms to use and all, like all this small stuff that we think is just, oh, like that's that's easy. Um, so it was just kind of eye-opening to talk to that group and, and just kind of answer the basic stuff, but also like it just providing them a lot of value, even though it is kind of, you know, straight line, like 101 stuff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you said it right. Of, I think a lot of us that uh, we've been in it, doing it for a while and things like that, some of the stuff we take for granted, I'm like, oh, that makes sense and stuff. But I think it is good to go back to those kind of initial things that people should consider or think about um, and, and, you know, discuss to get their questions answered. So um, let's just start with kind of the big one that a lot of people kind of ask about is like, what is the advantage? Uh, we can talk about like kind of advantages, disadvantages of buying from a wholesaler uh, versus buying off the MLS with an agent, things like that. I honestly, I think, I do think there are some advantages and some disadvantages of both. Um, you know, obviously when you're buying from, a, from an air through the MLS um, with an agent and things like that, there's certain advantages you have. You usually have basically there's the listing agent and the buying agent and things like that. They have your best there, you know, they should have your best interest at heart really. So you have people that are kind of looking out for you, looking out for kind of what's going on. And sometimes you not, might not necessarily have that with a wholesaler if you don't already have a relationship with them and, and know them and, and know how they operate and stuff like that. So there's some legality um, behind some of the stuff with the MLS um, that you're not going to have with, with dealing with a wholesaler. I think that's one of the first things that people need to consider and need to really kind of think about when they, when they're kind of looking at those two different things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, working, working with an agent is definitely an advantage. Um, you know, especially, you know, we talked, we talked about this a couple of times on the podcast, but if starting out, I mean, that could be the way to go. Just get, get your first couple of deals and understand like how things work. A um, couple of disadvantages, I think when, when trying to find properties on the MLS versus a wholesaler is that um, typically your price points on the MLS are going to be a little higher than what you might see on the wholesale market. Um, or the off-market properties. And the reason because, you know, not all sellers are expecting investors to come in and buy their property. You know, even if it's if it only needs about fifteen to twenty five thousand dollars worth of work, property still is pretty decent, but you know, an investor is going to want to come in and most likely give them a low offer and they could run the risk of being um, the seller being offended. And then, you know, the, the negotiation kind of, uh, you know, goes down the wrong path. But um, on the flip side, when you go to a wholesaler, I mean, wholesalers are aware most of the time, like, Hey, I'm selling to an investor. I'm just trying to do a quick sale, you know, give me your best offer and we'll see if it sticks. So the, the lingo and the kind of the, the back and forth negotiation, I think is, easier in my opinion with a wholesaler than it is working on for properties on the MLS. Yeah. Can be a little bit more nonchalant. It's kind of a, you know, yeah. hey, here's a, here's a conversation. Here's what it is. Um, here's my offers verbally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, you definitely have dealt with agents for like, Hey, here's my offer. I'm like, Oh, well you need that in writing and, and things like that. So there's, there are a couple extra steps and things. Um, uh, the, you know, you mentioned the price points and stuff like that too. They're generally going to be a little bit higher on the MLS, even though now I think some of this, some of the investment properties is almost kind of evened out of what wholesalers are asking for properties and what's on the yeah. MLS and things. Um, but then I think too, of just like, uh, um, you know, it comes down to working with an agent versus working with a wholesaler. Obviously, if you're tied in with an agent, usually they're kind of working on maybe like one or two. Um, 
you know, with wholesalers, you can be like, Hey, I can kind of work with anybody and everybody and stuff like that. Um, I know one of the things too, is working with a wholesaler. If you do have an agent that can still be done, you know, that can still be done. If you want to work through your Absolutely. agent with wholesalers and stuff like that. Um, so that's something that can be considered as well. Um, then you just got to kind of figure out the commission um, stuff of, are you going to be paying their commission at the end or is that going to come out of a wholesaler fee? Is that, you know, negotiated within the price and, and, and that type of thing. So yeah. Um, I say also too, just when you're buying off the MLS, it's kind of expected a little bit that you're going to be, you're going to have kind of an inspection period. Um, yeah, yep. you might have to sign an as is addendum and all that stuff. And, and yeah, that makes sense because the property is being sold as is, and maybe you're not doing, they're not doing something to it before they sell it to you, but you still have that right to kind of that inspection period and checking it out and, and that type of stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, anything else that we kind of miss there that you, that you can think of or anything? Yeah. I mean, uh, earnest money, uh, is yeah. typically refundable when you're working on an on-market property, uh, when the wholesaler, a lot of them uh, do non-refundable earnest money. So, you know, keep that in mind as well. Yeah. And that was one of the biggest questions. And that was one of the big questions that they kind of had. And they asked it a couple different ways, a couple different times um, was basically, you know, working with earnest money. They're like, number one, like why is earnest money like a lot higher than it used to be when you're working with wholesalers? Why yeah. is it non-refundable? That word keeps popping up, you know, over and over of like non-refundable earnest money up to like $5,000 a lot of times that we, mm-hmm. that we see um, and that people are doing. And I think honestly, it comes down to, we just have, I think as a wholesaler, I look at this and Randy is somebody that's selling all of our properties and stuff like it too. I just see, we have investors that are just, you know, getting things under contract to get under contract and then walking away from it way too easily. Yeah. Um, so that's something that we have to consider. And we as wholesalers have to do and people selling properties, we have to do our due diligence on the buyers themselves and, and that type of stuff of just cause you have the best offer. I might not accept it because I might not, you know, think that you're going to come through or what are you giving along with that offer? Are you doing a no inspection period or have you already seen the property? Have you walked it? Have you checked it out? Um, those types of things. So why I can definitely see the kind of the frustration standpoint from somebody that's, that's buying properties of like, Hey, I'm not going to put $5,000 that non non refundable earnest money in if, unless like you can definitely get me in the house, I can see it. And then we can get under contract. Like I'm not getting anything under contract unless that's, that's kind of, that's, that's how I'm looking at it. I know everybody has kind of their own, their own standpoint and stuff, but I think it's been a big change too of even I look at like last year, this time, you know, we didn't do it as much, but we were very seldomly buying properties blind. We were doing a little bit more last year though. Like, Hey, I'll just look at the pictures. We can go with this. The price points were still, still made sense right now. I'm not going to do that. Like I need to see the property. I need to look at it. Like I'm not going to just go off pictures. I'm not going to go off of somebody's word or anything like that. Like I need to see it because I am putting down earnest money when I'm buying a property now. And I, sometimes that is non-refundable and I want to make sure those terms are defined too. When you say it's non-refundable, what does that really mean? Does that mean that, you know, and that's something I want to make sure is defined on the purchase agreement um, or the assignment contract, whatever you're signing with them as a buyer, I would put in there like, Hey, if it's something that title, you know, is the title already clear? If the title is already clear, yeah, I have no problem doing non-refundable. If the title's not clear yet, I'm not doing anything non-refundable because yeah, I don't know any, if it's going to clear or not. Pop up if it's anything point. on the seller's <laughs> end, if it's anything on your end, like I don't, I, I'm not going to do that non-refundable stuff. Those are the things that I'm going to ask. I'm going to make sure that you know, that comes in, in the, in the contract work that we're doing of, of, of putting that wording in there and stuff. But, um, when we're really looking at it though, that's, that's, that's one of the, like I said, that's one of the big questions I had. And that's my, my answer for that for a lot of people is just like, do what you feel comfortable with and don't, don't do anything that doesn't get you outside of your comfort zone. If you're not yeah. willing to put down, you know, $2,500 earnest money to buy a property that you like, I'm personally going to question you as a, as a legit buyer. Um, now when you throw that non-refundable word in there, that do, I want to make sure that things are defined and what that really means. And I want to make sure that I look at it before I get under contract, those types of things. But yeah. you know, if you're only comfortable putting down a certain amount of money, that's, that's, that might limit you as a buyer, but that's who you are and, and stick to that if, that if that's what you do. I know a lot of times when we're buying properties, you know, front, direct from the seller and stuff like that, I have no problem putting down like $10,000 earnest money if it's going to secure me the property and, and see that it's, it's going to go through on the buy side. So Mm-hmm. Um, Randy, anything more to add just on that, the, on the earnest money stuff of just what buyers can look out for, or just, uh, kind of think about as they are looking at, um, you know, putting earnest money down on properties. Yeah. Just, I mean, for any given deal here in Indianapolis, I think just expect anywhere between a thousand to $5,000 earnest money, you know, hopefully, I mean, the lower, the better for the buyer, obviously, but I just keep that number in mind, that range in mind as, okay, this is probably going to be you know, in the range of a thousand to five thousand dollars earnest money, and and like you said, make sure that before you submit it or before you sign that uh, assignment, make sure it's outlined that you can, you know, you can get it back if there's some things out of your control, um, you know, that pop up in the deal that's going to make it go south, and 
Um, and it's not ab absolutely hard if the seller owes like $50,000 in fines and they can't close on the property, then you're out of $5,000 earnest money. So um, that's, that'd just be a good conversation to have before you solidify the deal. Yeah. And I would just say as a, as a buyer, you know, coming from somebody that's selling properties of just basically like, make sure that you're going to get a property under contract. Like you, we've talked about like what that looks like if you need to walk away and stuff. Like, as we just had, actually, we just had somebody do this like this week. We're just like, ah, I don't, they sent an eight, their agent. And he's like, ah, we didn't, we didn't like the property. We can't, we can't buy this one. Yeah. Well, what does that really mean? It doesn't really work like that. Like yeah, I need, I yeah. need some things of, I need something you concrete. Tell me, yeah, yeah. You give me, you need to give me a good reason. If it's a good reason, then like, we're going to, you know, that's how we operate it. Like, Hey, we'll give back your earnest money. If it's something that like makes sense or something that you didn't see right away or, you know, yeah. something like that. But if it's like, eh, just, I don't, I don't like the color. I changed my right, mind. I changed my mind. Yeah. Like that, yeah. that doesn't fly. Yeah. So one thing, one thing too, before we go to the next question, um, make sure you're sending your earnest money to the title company yeah. and not an individual or not directly to the wholesaler's bank account, because that's kind of a red flag right there. So, um, a new, a newer wholesaler might not know any better and say, Hey, just, you know, wired me the $2,500. But as a buyer, that should be a red flag to you, um, even if they are new or not, and just say, hey, I'd, I'd rather send it to the title company. Who, who do you have title work started with? I'll send it there. Yeah, I thought, yeah, and that's actually as a buyer, I've walked away from deals because they're like, oh, no, I need, you need to send me the earnest money, not the title company. I'm like, nah, with this, no, nah, that's not how I operate. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> we're going to send it here. We're going to be held like an escrow or that, you know, it's going to be held by, held, held by a third party, a safe third party and stuff like that. So um, yeah. I've walked away from deals because of that, and, you know, so. Um, something to consider there. So also um, they asked one of these questions. I thought this was a really good question and something I really haven't thought about um, kind of when you, you know, when I'm educating buyers and things like that is what are some other costs that people need to consider when they are buying from a wholesaler? Is there anything else that pops up? And, you know, aside from, you know, earnest money or even their assignment contract that you might end up seeing or, you know, how much they're making on the deal and stuff. Some of the other costs, the big ones that, I, that really stand out to me are just knowing what's going on with closing costs and knowing what's going on with taxes. Those are the things that I want to make sure are defined. Um, and one of my tips that I really, you know, I, I really think that everybody should do, and this is something that we do when we're buying properties from wholesalers and things, is I, I always ask to see their contract. I always ask to see the original purchase mm -hmm. agreement that they have. Um, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, I can see that they actually have an under contract that it's under contract with them. Um, we can talk about a little, some of the daisy chaining stuff and partners and, and things like that a little bit later. Um, but I want to, I want to see the contract because I want to see how it's defined. I tell them too, mm -hmm. like, Hey, I have no problem. If you want to white out or block out or do whatever to your, um, your assignment fee, if you don't want me to see that till we close, I'm okay with that. I don't care what you're making. I want to see what's on the contract though. I want to see that, you know, cause when people say, you know, buyer pays closing costs, there's a lot of things that are involved in that. Um, yeah. there's, there is an actual closing cost, which just takes care of the closing, but there's also, you know, title policy, title fees, things like that, that are considered, is that considered part of the closing costs? I want to make yeah. sure that's defined somewhere on there. So I know exactly what I'm paying and, and what I'm not and making sure that the seller understands what they're paying and what they're not as well, because a lot of times deals will fall apart at the closing table because the wholesaler never told the seller what they were actually responsible for, what they were getting, things like that. And sometimes yeah. deals fall apart. So the other one is taxes, making sure that's defined somewhere on that purchase agreement too. Um, whether, especially, you know, here in Indianapolis, since they're paid in arrears, the proration of taxes or non-proration is a pretty big thing um, here in Indianapolis. Um, Randy, yeah. can you do me a favor and just like kind of go through of like what that really means when they're talking about somebody's, Hey, taxes are prorated or taxes aren't prorated. Can you, can you just inform everybody of what that is? Because we're talking about like, Hey, it's common sense for us, but maybe some people don't know that. Yeah, because we'll use the lingo all the time, especially I will with our buyers, because um, most of the time uh, our buyers assume the property taxes. Basically, when you, someone assumes the property taxes in Indiana, they're going to pay the property tax bill on the next installment date. We pay them every May and November. So if someone says you're going to assume the property taxes or we're not going to prorate on the HUD, you're not going to see a credit on the buy side for the property tax of the previous year. We pay all our taxes in arrears in Indiana. So everything we pay this year for taxes for last year. Um, so, and for the most part, most wholesalers are going to structure their deal that way because they're working with the seller and you know, their value to the seller is, Hey, we'll pay out closing costs and, and assume property taxes. And then they're assigning all those, all those, um, you know, taxes and, and closing costs to you. So you're going to want to know, Hey, are properties being prorated or am I assuming them? And if they are being prorated, that simply means the seller is paying for last year's property tax up to the day of closing um, on the settlement statement. And then in turn, you get a credit for that. So that actually helps your, um, your money owed at closing a little bit. 
Um, and then when that installment date comes, um, taxes are already taken care of, then you'll, you'll pay the property taxes the next, for the next year. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of wholesalers think they think that they think taxes are just part of the closing costs and stuff too. And they say buyer pays closing costs or they send something like that. They're kind of thinking in their head of some, they don't understand it, maybe number one, but then they're also like, just assuming that like the buyer's going to pay a little bit of everything on that, on that, the closing costs, the title policy, the title insurance, um, that also like the taxes are included in that. Um, and then that turn two is when that, that seller thinks in their head of like, oh, my taxes are up to date. I just paid taxes on November 10th. My taxes are up to date. They're really not because you really, right. oh, you paid for 2019. You didn't pay for 2020. Yeah. Um, it's kind of how that works. So, um, and then they're going to owe taxes all the way up to the day of closing. So title yeah. company will figure out how much that is and then they'll, they'll pay for it at closing there. So yeah, it just because someone paid their tax bill in November, it doesn't mean there's no taxes due at this time. Right. There's always taxes due. Yeah. And then there's always that question too, of like when people say like, Hey, there's, there's no proration of taxes. So that's meaning that I'm going to assume taxes as a buyer. I wanted to make sure that that's defined as like, I'm assuming the taxes Normal. just for this year, not yeah. for any back taxes or anything right. like that. Um, so I want to make sure that's one of the reasons I do ask for that, you know, that assignment contract or that regular original purchase agreement. So I can see how all that stuff's outlined. Mm -hmm. um, because I do think that's important. And I go back to that thing too. Like I have no problem. They block out there. I've already agreed to a price or I always like to, or, you know, maybe we're negotiating things like that, but I already kind of know what price I want to be at. So I'm not worried about what they're making, what that is and stuff, but I just want to make sure that it's kind of defined. Um, so that's kind of a little tip that I, I would throw out there. Um, uh, so one of their questions is too, uh, just about contracts too. A lot of them are asking of like, is it okay for our attorneys to, to look over contracts if it's sent? Yeah. Like look, whoever, Absolutely. <laughs> whoever wants, whoever you want to look over that contract, if it could be, you know, it could be your, your, you know, your husband, your agent, your attorney, your grandma, whoever, whoever you feel comfortable looking over that contract, have them look over that contract. Yeah. Now, if that's going to be, it might put you in a time crunch because more people need to look at it and you might not be able to get an offer in or accept it mm -hmm. or, you know, give an offer, things like that, that could play in a rule to it. But if you are comfortable, if you're only really comfortable making a deal, with your attorney looking at that, then it's worth waiting for that to make sure your attorney gets a look at it. But if you're dealing with a wholesale that's ever like, oh no, your attorney can't look at that. I, just, I need to like, oh, what the, what, it, like that doesn't, yeah, <laughs> that shouldn't that's, make a difference. That's, for a, that's another property. red flag there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, whoever you need to look at the contract, have them look at the contract. Um, and it's, it's just um, from the buyer standpoint and make sure that that doesn't put you in a time crunch and make sure you're okay with how quickly that can move, how quickly they can look at it and how quickly you can actually put that offer in or accept that offer or anything like that um, and put in there. So another one, Randy, this is a good question for you too, of just like, how can, what are some things that investors can do to help build better relationships with wholesalers? Yeah, I think um, the really easy one, I know we talked about it on the call was um, follow through. I think yeah. if, if you commit to a deal, it's going to go a long way, especially for someone that you've never you've never met face to face. I mean, you know, everything's virtual, especially people overseas. If you get a property under contract and, you know, we agree on a price and we agree on a closing date, like follow through and close. And that's going to, like I said, that's going to be the number one thing. Uh, but, but even before that, it's just uh, keeping clear communication of what your expectations are as the buyer. And then, the, you know, follow, like agreeing with the wholesaler who says like, Hey, I need to close this in 15 days. And you say, no problem. All I need is 10 days to get my inspector in we can close in 15 days and then the 15th day comes and you say, I need like five more days. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm still running my numbers. I just want to make sure everything's, everything's in line, but they're still closed, which is fine. But it's the, it's the point of, you know, staying on track and staying in agreement to what everyone agreed to in the first place, because then that starts putting like a bad taste in their mouth. And that's kind of like your expectation moving forward of like, Hey, this buyer always, it's kind of iffy, you know, I don't know if they're going to close or not, which could, if you're competing on an offer with someone else in the future, they might pick someone else because they know that the other person's a sure thing. Um, and then just, I guess, just knowing, um, as always, knowing knowing what you want and knowing what you want to buy and not just kind of keeping it all scattered around um, as far as like your criteria goes. Yeah, I'd say uh, going on criteria and stuff too is make sure that you inform your wholesaler, your deal source, whoever it is, make sure you inform them of what if your criteria changes or if something yeah. pops up or you're looking at something new inform them. I know like Randy, he reached out to all of our buyers, you know, once a quarter and talks to them and updates their criteria and stuff like that. But 
if something changes or if you're looking for property like tomorrow, like don't wait for Randy to reach out to you or don't wait for, don't wait for your source to reach out to you. Reach out to them as well. Check in with them just as much as we, as we reach out to you guys. So I think that's one, that's, that's one thing that really stands out as well. So. Yeah. And then another, just one other thing is, you know, if, cause, cause people out of state do have the disadvantage when it comes to timing. So having, having your person, whoever it is, if it's a contractor an inspector or your property manager, have them ready to go look at the property as soon as you say, Hey, like I'm, I'm buying this property from so-and-so can you check on this either tonight or first thing in the morning, just so that you can get out there because the people that have to wait a couple of days just to get eyes on the property to confirm that they want to move forward <laughs> are losing out right now. And that's, yeah. that's a disadvantage. So just having, you know, at least that first point of contact in place is going to go a long way. Yeah. Not to, uh, not to be negative in any way, but I would say one of the things that is kind of a, a turnoff for, I'd say, wholesalers and investors in general or anybody that's like sourcing, you know, properties for people is right now I see, I think, you know, I see a lot of people that if, I, if we send out a property, like they might, res their first response back is like, hey, what's the lowest price you can do? Like, that's, that's not, that, that's not putting your best foot forward. That's like, kind I started, of I started all, I just started raising yeah. my price by five grand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's something that I would say I would advise against that. If it's something that, yeah, you, it's, you know, it's been on the market for a while or wholesalers had it for a while and things like that. And we, we have that conversation. We know like, Hey, this wholesaler sent out this property three weeks ago. They probably still have it under contract. We reach out and say, Hey, is there, you know, are you, do you still have this under contract? Is it, are you still looking to move it? Like, do you need help moving it? Like, what's the, what's like, what do you need out of it? You know, that's even just a better way to put it. Like, what do you need? What do you, what do you need to get out versus like, Hey, what's the lowest you can do? So especially right now in a competitive market, like it's just, it's one of those things of like, we sent out a property, like I'm not going to look at the lowest price. Like I'm not going to give the yeah. lowest price out, you know, right away. We're going to look at like kind of, Hey, what are some of the best offers? What are the strongest offers? And then not just the price itself, but what comes along with that offer as well, as far as, you know, being able to close quickly inspection time, what type of, you know, what type of money are you using? Those types of things have all this stuff ready and make sure that you include that when, if you are doing like a verbal offer or an email offer of like, Hey, I can buy this at $60,000 with, you know, my guy can get out there today to look, to inspect it. I can close with cash. I can close with intended, you know, whatever it is, include that stuff in your offer. I think it makes it a little bit stronger and stuff and, and be honest about that stuff as well. Don't, mm -hmm. don't stress your limits. Don't make your offer seem better than what it is. Um, those types yeah. of things. So, um, <clears throat> Let's see. So one of the other things that came up is just the, the idea of, of, of daisy chaining. They were kind of like asking like, Hey, we, we've heard about this. We've told, we've been, we've been told to like be aware of it and things. And just to, just to speak on this real quick is like one of the things that I always ask is um, if a wholesaler sends out a deal and I like it, I'm going to make an offer on it. I always just ask them like, Hey, do you have this under contract? You know, that's, that's what I want to know. Um, we all know that there's people out there that, that send deals out that aren't their deals. If Randy sends a deal out, you know, today at noon, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to get it back to me at three o'clock with a higher price on it, you know, just with our, without our market. That's going to happen. Um, people are trying to steal deals. People do it all the time. So one of the things to ask is like, hey, do you have this under contract? And when they say, no, my partner does or things like that, just ask, what's their, what's their relationship? What, like, how are you connected yeah. to this person? How are they your partner? you know, and then, you know, try to figure out that way. Um, usually if you search around on Facebook somewhere else, you'll see it from another person, um, mm -hmm. that type of thing. And sometimes it's a headache of being like, oh, figuring out who really has it and what's, what's going on with it and stuff. But, um, can you get deals through Daisy chain? So yeah, you, you probably can. And it's not, I'm not going to like, I, I, I'm not a big fan of it because people try to sell our properties without any relationship with us. And that's, that's tough. But I know there are people out there that actually do have relationships with people that like can, you know, it yeah. can be that connector and can be that helper and can be that thing. And they're not trying to make, you know, 20 grand off of Daisy chain in a deal and stuff. So there is a little bit of legitimacy to it, but I always just kind of back and be like, Hey, is, you know, is this your deal? Do you have it under contract? What's going on with it? Because when there is somebody, the more people that are involved in a deal, we all know that the more things there are that mess up somehow along yeah. the way. So yeah. just be careful of that. There's that one more person in it and be like, Oh no, I already accepted an offer from somebody else or, Oh, I got a higher offer. So there's the less people involved in a deal, it's the better it's going to be. So yeah. something to be careful of, something to look out for. Um, my wording is usually like, Hey, do you have this under contract? Yep. Can you send me the contract? Can I see it? Block out your price. I'm good with it. Let's go from there. And then we can, you know, we can work. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, I, one of the other questions is, I know this, this kind of goes back to the relationship thing, but this is always, this is the hot topic now for a lot of people of like, Hey, how do I, how do I get in your inner circle? How do I get to be the first one to, uh, 
to find, to see a property, to buy a property, that type of thing. And honestly, I think it's just, it comes back to what you originally said, Randy, too, of just coming through. Like, do we have a relationship with you? Do we know you? Do we know what you're looking for? Like we, yeah. you can be the first one to see a property from us. If it's, if it's exactly what, if we know exactly what you're looking for and you seem like a legit person and things like that, like, yeah, we'll send you a property. You might not be the only one to see it, um, you know, we're right. going to have, we're going to send it out to, you know, a few different people that it fits their criteria specifically and stuff. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, um, Randy, I actually, I'll let you kind of talk on that a little bit of just like, how do you, you know, how do, how do people get in your, your inner circle? How do they get the, the magic formula to be able to find your properties, man? How do they, how do they get the deal first, right? Before anybody else? Well, yeah, you kind of mentioned it, like you said, I, I think, I mean, I always have, uh, you know, you can call it whatever you want, like a, a VIP list or, you know, a big buyer list, uh, whatever fancy name you want to come up with it. But basically everyone on that list for me are people who are continuously buying properties from me, you know, month in and month out people who have bought um, multiple properties from us in the past or people who I know I could see, you know, through public record, like they're, they are buying properties all the time, not just from a wholesaler, but a wholesaler on market, off market. Um, so I know that they're a heavy player. That's pretty much everyone on that list for me is, is that's what they're doing. Um, so I think the first thing is, uh, yeah, come through on a property, um, you know, close fast, you know, have all your money ready to go. And just if it was a, if it was a hiccup free property, um, if th some things come up, I know we can hold up a deal, but if it's, if everything went as planned, um, then boom, like right there, you're, you're automatically in, you know, a power player list that says, okay, this person can perform and I'd love to do deals with them again. And then, um, you know, they'll, they'll probably get an extra email from me one or two. <laughs> yeah. So um, we'll get into, so as we wrap up the show, you just like, just kind of one last tip um, that we, that we each want to give and stuff. My tip is really just like kind of having your, um, I like just having, having somebody that can look at it and basically looking at a deal before you get under contract. I think that's where a lot of people get, you know, in trouble of like, it, they say, see the pictures, they see the walkthrough video, they see all the stats, they run all their numbers, they get under contract and then they send somebody out. I think that's where a lot of people get in trouble, you know, and don't, I don't think it's, it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. You can even say like, Hey, I'm really interested in this property. I like it at this price. I need to get somebody in it. Are you, when are you accepting your offer? When do you expect to, to, you know, when do you expect to, to accept an offer? Like, do I have 24 hours? You know, can you not accept an offer until tomorrow? If I have somebody to go look at it this evening, you know, what are it is having those conversations, but making sure I look at a property and take care of it you know, have my boots on the ground, check it out before I actually get it under contract. Um, number one, it's going to help you out and make you, you know, it's one less thing that you have to worry about when it comes to walking away because your, your people have already seen it, but then also just puts you, um, just helps develop that relationship with that wholesale a little bit more because you, you, you have checked it out. You're more legit and you're not going to walk away from that deal because you've seen it and know what it's all about. Yeah. And I would just say, um, you know, always have your money ready. So a, a lot of good questions I get, especially I had, I just recently had a conversation with somebody. They said, Hey, like I've got cash to do the deal. Would you accept hard money? Would you accept conventional financing? Would you accept, you know, any other type of financing just so they have, you know, other options if they wanted to buy a couple properties from you. Um, I just think asking that question to whoever you're working with could go a long way because it could open the door to other, other properties. Like, Hey, like I told them, yeah, we will sell or finance you a deal. <laughs> oh, tell me about that. So yeah. they could buy a property for me with cash and they could take another one on through seller financing. Um, cause that's what their funds were, were able to do at that time. So, um, if whatever, whatever financing you have, just have it ready. Um, uh, but always ask if there's any other option, um, to close the deal. Yeah. So that's a really good tip. I mean, I just, I was talking to somebody about that earlier this week of like where he has cash to move on a property, but if he's seller finances, he can actually buy like three and just, you know, spread yeah. it out over time. That cash goes a lot longer or, you know, it's, it's spread out across a couple of different properties because, you know, he's only doing it for the, for the, you know, the money down and stuff. So um, really good tips, really good stuff here. Um, I thought it was a really good conversation that we had um, with this group of investors. I'm really happy with them and, and developing a relationship with them and stuff. Um, let us know if there's anything else we can help you out with. Uh, Randy at simplewholesaling.com or Brian at simplewholesaling.com. We are more than happy to help you out with anything. And with that, that's another episode of the Indie Investor Pod. We'll see you guys next time. Take care.